Well, the old saying goes, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. I think tonight's story is going to make you reconsider that and think about it twice. <laughs> There's something about the notion of the hitchhiker, letting a stranger into your safe place that's extremely evocative in the world of horror. Tonight's story takes the hitchhiker trope into a strange and unexpected place. I think you can really enjoy this one. Be prepared for a bit of a surprise at the end. Now, my dear friends, it's Friday. We've made it to the weekend, so sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. I remember... It was grade school when I first met the twins. Even in first grade, they had the latest phones and claimed they had bank accounts. They had a driver bring in fast food from nearby nearly every day until the school made it a policy, stating over the loudspeaker that no outside food would be allowed during lunchtime. Naturally, everyone wanted to be friends with them because they had everything. And at that age, ownership of the newest Game Boy or PS2 game or virtually having an entire Lego palace in your house made you pretty popular. One particular day in 7th grade, I remember showing them my action replay, which is pretty much a hack for the handheld Nintendo DS, and hacking them any Pokemon they wanted into their Diamond version. That day, we started our long-lasting friendship that started with something as small as a cheat for a video game. We lived in a pretty small town, there was only one or two options for high school, so, as you can imagine, most of us from grade school ended up in the same high school. At this point, I learned that their father was the owner of a big bank branch, and several small companies. That explained the lavish lifestyle they lived throughout the grade school, and pretty much their entire lives. I wasn't their friend for the money, but I can't lie and say it wasn't a nice addition to my life. I ended up being pretty much their closest friend, and they weren't shy about giving me a taste of their life. At first, I was reluctant to dine with them in high-quality restaurants or shop with them at designer stores with the offer that my entire bill would be paid, because it felt like I was leeching off them. Eventually, though, I became comfortable with it. I was pretty much a part of their family. Their parents were never around much, <laughs> cliché, I know, and the friends they had never stuck around too long, because most of them were, obviously, just in it for the money. It wasn't without reason, though. The twins were cocky and very outgoing, which made them more approachable, but at the same time it added to the rich asshole persona that drove a lot of people off. Hanging out with them for a long time, though, I learned that they were genuinely likeable. Funny to be around, and caring people at heart. When a classmate that they barely knew ended up being diagnosed with brain cancer, they put a load of money towards their recovery process without hesitation. I grew even closer to them during high school, hanging out with them nearly every day. When we graduated, we ended up going to different colleges. Unexpectedly, they ended up getting into Yale, while I decided to go to community college for a few years to save on money. We all agreed that we definitely needed to stay in touch. But, unfortunately, as most of us know, that's harder than it seems sometimes, and we ended up drifting apart for most of the year. Closing in on the end of the year, I received a call from them. They said it had been too long since we'd seen each other, and that we should do an end-of-year trip to reconcile. I thought that was a great idea, especially seeing as they offered to pay for it. At first, I thought they wanted to fly out somewhere, but they'd been to so many different countries before. Surprisingly, they'd never been to another state before they went to college. So, we decided to take road trips every year, at the end of the year to take a different state by car. We ended up doing these trips for all four years of college, each time going across country to a different place. In the fourth year, we travelled out to Florida and had some massive parties. We could make the drive back home in a day, but the car ride was gruelling. One of the twins, let's call him Harris, was driving, 
and me and the other twin, Gabe, were drinking beers in the back. We were about an hour away from home, and it was 11 o'clock at night, pitch black outside. We were driving down a stretch of two lane roads, and we spotted a figure on the side of the road waving his hand out. Harris instantly made me pull over, but my body filled with dread. I'd read plenty of no sleep, and I'd scared the shit out of myself with horror movies, and, well... This seemed like the exact start to one of those stories. I told Harris not to pull over, that this man could potentially be dangerous, but he just laughed and slowed the car to a halt in front of the person. He opened the window on the passenger side, and the man leaned his head in the window, now illuminated by the car light. He was a dark-skinned man with a bald head and strong facial features. I could see that he was wearing a black button-up with the top two buttons undone, and a purple tie slung over his shoulder. He was visibly sweating, and looked pretty disheveled in general, which was probably due to the heat that night. Oh, God bless you. I've been waiting here looking for someone to pick me up for hours now, he said. Harris looked sympathetic. How'd you end up out here? The man wiped his forehead on his shirt. Oh, I drove out for some business I had to do. I'm connected with the church, and I had to help the church in this town with some classes. I was heading down this road, and I saw an accident. Naturally, I came over to help. But the two guys ended up pulling guns on me and driving my car away, which had everything in it. That was about three hours ago, and I've been walking down here since. I don't know if it was the alcohol, but I sure didn't believe this man. His story sounded too convenient. His occupation was too convenient. There was something sinister going on. Apparently Harris didn't share the same thoughts, though. He stretched over and opened the passenger side without any hesitation. And, just like that, we had a hitchhiker. I glanced over at Gabe to gauge his reaction. He was dead asleep. He'd drunk way more than I had. I was heavily on edge. It wasn't like he was menacing. In fact, the way he talked in the car about his life in a strangely soothing tone was almost relaxing. Nonetheless, I was checking his every move and ready to spring out the car the first chance I got. (laughs) On reflection, I was definitely overreacting. And, like I said, this was probably due to the alcohol. I didn't even notice when the car stopped, and I looked out of the window to see my house. I'm dropping you off first since your house is closer, Harris said. It was true. The town in which the man claimed to live was at least 20 minutes away from ours. I looked pleadingly at Harris without wanting to verbally make it clear that I did not want him in the car alone with that man. I got nothing back but an eye roll. Okay, call me as soon as you get home, I said to him, reluctantly exiting the car. I felt a cold grip on my wrist. The man had turned around and grabbed my hand through the gap between the seat and the door, smiling at me. Bless your soul. Thank you for helping me out tonight. At the time, those words sounded as sinister as if he'd threatened to murder my entire family. I said nothing and departed into my house. Now, I'd like to say I was eaten up by worry, and I ended staying awake all night to wait for a call from my friends. But that would be a straight-up lie. My foggy, intoxicated brain couldn't handle much more, and I pretty much glided into bed that night. I'll never forget the dream I had that night, though. The passing years have proved that this type of thing doesn't just erase from your brain. My dream was a blurry highway. It was like I was looking at a video shot from a bird's eye view camera, but there was fog all over the lens when it was shot. The view seemed to slowly move down the highway until it stopped on a familiar car, the twins' car. The camera seemed to zoom in slowly to the car, but the lights were out and nothing could be seen. Out of nowhere, a 
blood-curdling, near-inhuman scream came from the car. I will never forget this scream, simply because I'd never heard anything like it before, so I couldn't comprehend how I was hearing it in my dream. It was utterly primal and laced with fear. Then, a pair of red eyes stared at the camera, as if they knew I was intruding on the scene. I woke up that morning in a very cold sweat. I remember the dream extremely vividly. Ignoring the splitting headache that was gnawing at my head as a reminder that large quantities of alcohol are not fun to deal with the day after, I texted both of the twins. Ten minutes passed, no response. I tried calling each of them four or five times. Again, no response. I hopped in my car and stopped in front of their massive manor house. I buzzed at the gate, but to no avail. I was downright panicking now. If they didn't answer by tonight, I was definitely going to call the police. That evening, I called one last time, before I headed down to the police station. Hello? Gabe's voice came through the receiver. A wave of relief washed over me. Jeez, Christ, dude. I thought you guys died. Why the hell didn't you answer anything I was sending? I could hear Gabe chuckling. Of course it was funny to him. Ah, oh, I was knocked out until an hour ago, and Harris couldn't find his phone. Must have left it back in Florida. Jeez, I was literally a minute away from going to the police station, man. You didn't even answer your buzzer. I can imagine a shrug came along with this answer. Harris was a fucking wreck. You know how much that phone is to him. He probably didn't even care that someone was there. The incident was never spoken about again in the next two years. In fact, I'd forgotten about the entire thing, even temporarily about the dream. Me and the twins didn't really speak much after we all graduated. We moved on to separate lives. Yeah, that happens sometimes. Nothing lasts forever. I always remembered them, though, because they still, occasionally, came back to that beautiful manor that I drove past quite often. One day, though, driving home past the manor, I was surprised to see police cars surrounding the place. Curiosity, and even a bit of fear, overwhelming me. I slowed down and pulled over nearby. Was there a break-in? Maybe one of them could even have gotten attacked by a rival company of their father's. I had to know. I stepped out of the car and walked to the group of police cars blocking the entrance to the house. What happened here? I asked an officer that was standing watch on the street. Do you reside or work here? He asked. I frowned. Uh, no, I'm an old close friend of the twins. The officer looked interested now. He muttered something incoherent into his walkie-talkie and motioned me to follow him. Do you mind coming with me for a few minutes? I was confused but obliged. I had no reason not to. That's when everything really began to turn upside down. I ended up going down to the police station with an officer, and he started questioning me about the personality and nature of the twins, not giving me any insight into what had happened. I told him as truthfully as I could, they were wild, but not bad people. Generous, even. The officer seemed to write this down, and left me alone in the room for about ten minutes. Then he came back and explained the situation. A couple of weeks ago, we got a report from the next town over that they needed us for help in a case. A fisherman had taken his boat out near a swamp, and he found something floating in the water. He reeled it in, and it was, in fact... A severed human head, nearly reduced to a skull. My stomach sank. One of the twins had died, and in a terrible way. I instantly felt the beginning of tears creeping up to my eyes. It was reported, and eventually the officers did an extensive search of the area, and they found a body buried nearby. It was hard to identify but we eventually matched it back to someone who'd been missing for a while. A priest. Hmm. 
now I was confused again. So it wasn't one of them. How was this relevant to the twins? We managed to get DNA from the body, and we found a massive amount of Harris and Gabe's DNA at the scene. I felt dizzy. You think they killed them? They're some of the kindest people I know. That's, that's straight up ridiculous. I was in denial. There was no way they'd killed anyone. I knew them better than their damn parents did, and murder was completely beyond them. But then, a little gear clicked in my head. I remembered the hitchhiker. I remembered leaving them alone in the car, and the casual smile on Harris's face. I remembered the dream, with the scream of a voice I didn't know. And I felt sick. If I had eaten that day, I would have thrown up everything in my stomach. Instead, I just sat there, paralyzed. I told the officer what I knew. For the next few days, I was insanely depressed. I didn't go to work. I didn't eat or drink much. I didn't even leave the house. Were my two childhood friends really murderers? There was just no way that they could be. There was no reason for them to do it. Neither of them had shown even a slight violent tendency in their entire life, well, as far as I'd seen. The trial came up. They were being accused of first-degree murder. I was going to testify that I could put them at the scene of the crime that night. I think the only reason I did it was because I had to know. It was eating me up inside and killing my entire life. The thought that my childhood best friends were murderers. That day at the trial was an unforgettable one. Gabe and Harris walked in with the same smirks on their faces that they held nearly every single day of their life, not showing any fear, remorse, or even anger, just pure cockiness. They sat in front of the judge with the same smirk the entire time the prosecutor was talking and even their own defense lawyer. And then it came time for them to speak. Harris rose. Oh, that day was beautiful. As soon as we saw him on the side of the road, I knew we were going to murder him. His smirk had died down to a genuine smile that glazed his eyes and brought a look of euphoria to his face. My blood ran cold. Oh, the man babbled on about his situation, but I could just imagine slicing him open while he was talking, so it was a bit hard to focus. It's sometimes so hard to restrain myself from doing what I love the most, but it's worth it. The drive after that was pure torture. I dropped our friend off, and we started off to the poor man's town. There was a dark highway, and I pretended that I hid an animal in the middle of the road. I rushed out of the car and I was acting worried and concerned, so the priest came to get a better look. He was confused when he saw nothing, but he didn't have much time to think when Gabe came from behind him with a metal pipe. <laughs> we keep that in the back of our car for uh, <laughs> emergencies, you know. Gabe was smirking harder than ever, and I felt sick. Oh, he really did a number on that guy's head. His skull busted open and I could even see his beautiful little brain. <laughs> After that, we took him to the back seat for uh, the pleasantries. Now, I'm not really into other guys, but corpses really get me turned on like nothing else. Then I got the knife and I started gouging at him. Just for the fun of it, you know. What's the fun in getting a new toy and not playing with it? But... Like most new toys, I ended up getting really bored of it. Eventually, I started working at the head and pretty much ripped it off from the spine. Oof, it was crazy. Gabe chimed in. Hey, bullshit, I helped. You barely did anything. Harris rolled his eyes, as though what he was talking about was trivial. Uh, anyhow, we ended up burying the body and dumping the head in some swamp. Crushed the teeth so I could have a little one-on-one -on -one time with his mouth. And then we left. 
we got a little caught up in the act, so we ended up spending a lot more time than we hoped to out there. Everyone in the courtroom was silent. Even the lawyers and judge couldn't find a word to say. I felt like I was going to black out. I was smart. I didn't eat anything that morning. But I still felt as though my stomach was going to empty out whatever was left in there at all costs. I closed my eyes as tears started to leak out. This was a nightmare. Harris broke the silence again. What he said this time, well, I'll spare you the entire thing. I'm getting nauseated thinking about every little detail that he provided for the three other murders he'd committed. 22-year-old girl in California. They grabbed her at a concert, cut out her tongue and stabbed her four times in the throat. They threw her body down onto the rocks below. 25-year-old girl in Chicago. Harry stabbed her to death in the bathroom of a nightclub, and they snuck her body out through a window. They beat her corpse to unimaginable lengths and left her in a dumpster. A 30-year-old in Vegas. They punctured her throat with her own high heels and forced her to swallow shards of a martini glass before drowning her in a hotel room tub. A cold dread crept up my entire body. I saw black spots in my vision and tried to blink them away. I was with them on every one of those trips. As if reading my mind, Harris turned to me. He smiled another genuine grin. <laughs> every single time, our friend was with us. In California, we lost him at the concert and talked to him minutes later after murdering that sweet girl. Chicago, <laughs> he was drunk in the car when we had Ashley's dead body in the trunk. And Vegas, he grinned even harder. I dropped a little thing called Ropinol in his drink. And we killed her, not even ten feet away from him, while he was dead asleep. I rushed out of the courtroom with my head in a blur and headed to the bathroom. I vomited up everything that was left in my stomach and lay on the cold, dirty tile next to the toilet. I felt another wave of nausea and everything faded to black. Apparently, I'd fainted due to stress and woke up in a hospital bed. No permanent damage, nothing wrong with me. Well, aside from the obvious... I found out that the two had been convicted on every murder because they had provided the locations of the bodies and the injuries matched completely with Harris's account. I didn't go back to the court to testify. I didn't need to. Four life sentences were given out to each of them in the next few weeks. And apparently, they were still smirking when they were given the maximum sentence in a maximum security prison. The two were never going to see the outside world for the rest of their lives. I was horrified at first. I had been present for every single murder. No legal action would be taken against me, but just the thought made it enough that I was unable to get any sleep for the next month. I went to work every day like a zombie. I was losing weight. I was depressed. I don't know how, but I did get over it. I couldn't sit and live in despair my entire life. That would have meant that they'd won. They wanted to torture me. They wanted to break me like they did to their victims. But I wouldn't let them. Sometimes, I wonder if they were always like this. But, or did something change them? I've come to the conclusion that they had to be like this the entire time. I think the evil had to be lurking inside them waiting for a single opportunity to present itself to the world. This story didn't hit the media, of course. Money controls this world, and someone like their father isn't going to let a small stain like this ruin his perfect company. Anyone who wasn't in the courtroom that day wouldn't know a thing. 
I wonder exactly how much money he lost covering up this entire thing. He didn't show at the trial and didn't make a statement. As far as the world knew, those twins had no connection to him. It's been years since that day in the courtroom, and I've moved on, for the sake of myself and everyone that the twins hurt. I have a good life. I have a family. It sounds cliche, but man, I was goddamn blessed to still have my life. They never showed any hostility towards me. Never showed any signs. But they could have killed me plenty of times. I had no guard around them. Like I said, I've moved on for the most part. And still, there are always late nights when I'm sitting up in bed unable to sleep. I start to feel terror. My mind starts to race and the dread creeps up on me like vines curling up my skin. I never told them about the dreams. I remembered them when I woke up in the hospital. Not just that one night, no. I had a dream during every single trip. Specifically, the nights when the murders occurred. Every time the setting was different. One near a cliff. One in a bathroom. One in a hotel room. Every time the scream was different. But the red eyes were always the same. Oh my god, that was a mean little story, wasn't it? Weren't expecting that, were you? I certainly wasn't. Well, let me know what you think in the comments below the vid. And as ever, I will, I promise, do my best to reply to everybody. Now, you have a good weekend, because I've got a great story lined up for you on Monday. Get some rest, you're going to need it for Monday story. <laughs> you have a good one. I'll be back again real soon, and I hope you'll join me. But for now, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs> <laughs>